single church. Yeah, something to keep in mind and be thinking about for down, down the road when you're sick. Uh, Martha Lytle remains in the swing bed in Friona. Carolyn, you said you saw her last week. She's doing well, re ready to come home, but not quite. see that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Dean visited with Clarence Barron yesterday. He is back at the home in Dimmit and uh, he's doing doing well but he's still having some ongoing effects from the infection and leg problems that he had uh, earlier. Uh, remember today is a fifth Sunday for this year, so immediately after our services we'll have a potluck down in the fellowship hall. And when that's done we're going to have our devotional down in the fellowship hall and uh, be dismissed for the day. Hope you like some. I didn't call any names. You just confessed. It's all right. All right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Gracious Father, we're so grateful to you for your blessings in our lives, for your being with us, for your watching over us, keeping us through this night, and bringing us through to this new day. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity now to spend a little time in your word. I just pray, Father, that uh, as we look at the message of, uh, of, of, of you through the prophets, particularly Jeremiah, we might be reminded of things in our lives to encourage us to faithfulness to you, to your service, and if necessary, that we might be reprimanded to, to repent, to return in whatever area we may be lacking. Thank you for the progress that Philip is making. Bless him and be with him and Alice during this time. And help ease his mind with regard to the potential dismissal from rehab in Colorado and transferring down to Austin. Thank you for the progress that Martha has made. We pray that she is soon able to come home. And also for Clarence and his progress and his family. We pray that the continuing uh, effects or after effects of the infection that he had will soon be gone. Bless us all, Father, as we seek to know your word and, and do it in our lives. Thank you for Christ. We pray in his name. All right, last week we began uh, a study entitled, Our God is an Awesome God. And what I think I, I tried to get across last week as we began is that I want us to go back and look at Israel, particularly Israel in the latter stages. And when I say that, I, I'm talking about Judah, the southern kingdom, because at the point that we're looking at in her history, the northern kingdom is already gone. They've already gone off to Assyrian captivity. Babylonian captivity is not far off as far and we're doing it again right there. I don't know what it is. Anyway, uh, we started out looking at a passage in uh, 2 Kings 22 last week. 2 Kings 22. 
two. There, what was the unusual discovery that we made that we talked about? The book of the law was found where? In the temple. They're actually doing some, I don't know if you could call it remodeling, upgrading. They're doing some work in the temple. The temple's been neglected. Uh, it's not really been a place of worship of God for a long time. Idols have been brought in. Uh, things are not going well, but young King Josiah has ordered this take place. And in the midst of it taking place, they find a copy of the book of the law. Exactly what all was involved in that, I'm not sure. I mentioned last week, perhaps it was the Pentateuch. Uh, but then I got to thinking, talks about it being read a couple of times here in these verses. Uh, so it wouldn't have been that, uh, maybe not that long. Maybe it was just Leviticus that they found. Uh, and given the laws and the sacrifices and things along that line, but whatever. Uh, we talked about uh, when does when did the finding of that book have begin to have some uh, significance? Yeah, what was that the word? Read it. When it was read, yeah, the king was told about it, and, and, and he said, okay, read it to me. So when he heard what it said, he began to realize, whoa, we're not doing this. We've gone away from God. I mean, the, the high priest had, had found or had not thought anything about it. He'd given it to a scribe, and he really didn't think a thing, anything about it. And finally, it was read, and, and kind of as an afterthought, oh, by the way, King Josiah, we found this book. Well, what does the book say? Read it to me. So the scribe read it to him. Josiah says, whoa, we, we messed up. We haven't done what we need to do. So that's kind of what we really looked at last week. We saw all these guys, the high priest, the workers, uh, the scribe, all of the, you know, nothing indicates that, that anybody had a real sense of the importance of the book until even, even the scribe that read it initially seems like it's an afterthought when he mentions it to Josiah. Oh, by the way, we found this. Good question. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it was, yeah. Or Josiah, I don't remember. Amon, uh, yeah, it was his. It was Joseph. Yeah, Manasseh was really evil. Yeah, it's true. He did. He did. But he had already brought in so much evil, idolatry, not following the law. His. says they did. It says they sacrificed their children in the valley of Hinnom, which is the valley outside of Jerusalem. It's often referred to to illustrate the, the fires of hell because it was gar the city garbage dump, basically. What they did. Yeah, Josiah would be Manasseh's grandson. Manasseh was bad. He repented at the end, but it didn't affect his son Ammon any. Ammon was bad, and, and here comes Josiah, who becomes king when he's eight years old. And this, uh, I think it said it's the 18th year of his reign. Yeah, and uh, they find this book. And so he starts all these reforms, and that's one thing Josiah is, is remembered for, is all the reforms that he began. Uh, now some of them were not, in fact, probably most of them were not carried out completely. 
So we, we introduced all of that last week in talking about 2 Kings 22. I want us to turn and spend some time probably today and next week looking at Jeremiah chapter 1 today. Jeremiah the prophet. How long has it been since you really looked at Jeremiah, the man or the book? Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, at least my experience growing up in the church, we did a really good job in Sunday schools teaching Genesis through Well, I guess through the captivity, both in teaching the history of some of, some of the things, but the prophets were not always really brought into it all. Uh, they were mentioned, some things said about them, but as far as looking at them, I don't remember a lot growing up about the prophets being taught in, in, in some, and maybe that was just my experience, but... Uh, Anyway, we're going to spend some time starting today with Jeremiah for a couple of weeks or three, whatever it takes to go through the part I want to look at. We're also going to look at, at Hosea and uh, Nahum. And it seemed like there's another one that needs to spend some time talking about. But anyway, we're going to start with Jeremiah. Look at the first three verses. See if you recognize any names from what we read in 2 Kings 22. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Micaiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Recognize any names? One should have stood out to you. Yeah, Josiah was the king. Hilkiah. First, Second Kings 22, who was Hilkiah? The high priest. Now, we, this one, and we don't know for sure that that high, Hilkiah, the high priest, was actually the Hilkiah that was Jeremiah's father. It's a possibility. The time frame fits. But there's nothing specifically said in Scripture that said, ties them. Uh, it just says that he is the son of Hilkiah, of the priest, who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. So it possibly is his father that cleaning out the temple found the book and didn't really do anything about it. Don't know that for certain. There seems to be no way to determine whether or not that's true. Uh, one author also pointed out, uh, looking on ahead into Jeremiah, um, that he uh, had an uncle according to Jeremiah 32, 7, by the name of Shalom, S-H-A-L-L-U-M. Back in 2 Kings 22, we didn't go as far as verse 14, but a man by the name of Shalom is the husband of Huldah, the prophetess. Fame Shalom? No. Likely. 
possibly. The point is, there's a very real potential that Jeremiah had family in the upper echelons of Jewish society of that day. If these two shallums were the same purpose, he's linked to relatives that were influential during the time of Josiah's reformation and restoration efforts. So that puts him, you know, he's not just somebody from the backwaters of, you know, wherever. He was someone who had family, very likely, or potentially had family in, in the royal circles, if you will, upper levels of, uh, of society. And another thing from these three verses, if you do the math, Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years. Actually, I guess I ought to say 40 plus years. During all the, you know, the last kings, Josiah, well, he names them there, Josiah and uh, his son, Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah, who was also his son. Zedekiah was the last king in the southern kingdom before they went off into Babylonian captivity. So 40, and well, and, and Jeremiah prophesies even beyond that because there's a small remnant of the Jews when the captivity begins, or right before it begins, they decide that they're going to go to Egypt. And they're going to leave the southern kingdom, leave Jerusalem, and they're going to go to Egypt. This is over in Jeremiah chapter uh, 40 to 44. And they force, literally force, Jeremiah to go with them. So he still prophesies on God's behalf uh, down in, in Egypt with that group. So that kind of introduces us to who Jeremiah is. Beginning in verse 4 and going down through verse uh, 9 is Jeremiah's call to be a prophet. Jeremiah's call to be a prophet. And there's some interesting things in here. And uh, we're looking at this to get us to get a, a, an understanding and a background of why God calls Jeremiah, what's going on with Israel, and what Jeremiah's task was in calling Israel. I keep saying Israel, so if I do that, think Judah, okay? Because Israel's already gone. Judah, the southern kingdom, is left. Verse 4, Jeremiah 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build, to plant. So here's Jeremiah's call uh, to be a prophet. What does, what's the first thing that strikes you about verse 5? Behold, I formed you in the womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. <coughs> Excuse me. 
What do you think God's trying to say to Jeremiah? I have plans for you. And I want you to carry this out. So, does Jeremiah have a choice? Sure he does. Sure he does. God never created a human at any time as a robot. To simply go through the motions and do exactly, you know, like he's programmed to do certain things in certain ways at certain times. He's always, and every person who's ever lived has always had the option of obeying God or not obeying God. So God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Talking about God's what? Knowing everything, all knowing. He knew. I mean, we're talking about God, who later is described as the one who sees the end from the beginning. Nothing surprises God because he knows what's going to happen. And so he knew Jeremiah, and he knew the nature of Jeremiah, the, the mentality, if you will, the physical characteristics, the physical traits. And he knew that Jeremiah was one who could carry out what he wanted done. And so he comes to him and he calls him uh, to, uh, to service. Does God still do that? True. He tells us to. He's not going to come to us in directly talk to us like apparently he did to Jeremiah. He still calls us through his word to be his. Okay? God gives life. He get Yeah, he gives us souls and and he gives us free will. And he presents to us through his word his call to come and follow and do his will, to be his people, to be his uh, spokesman. Uh, you know, God's, You know, God says, God's word says, that he is no respecter of persons. In the Acts chapter 10, where Peter saw the vision of the sheep with all the animals in it, and God was commissioning him to go to the house of Cornelius. And so, while we might not have a vision calling Jeremiah or others of the Old Testament prophets. We are called. He does have a plan for us. He does have a purpose for us. And in our response to Scripture and in, in His Word, uh, that planning can carry out. I mean, you Look in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, and beginning in verse 21. Uh, Isaac is concerned because Rebekah has not had any children. So he prays to God about this, and God blesses them and answered his prayer, and Rebekah conceives. But then it says in verse 22, of Genesis 25, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, you see, because the Lord knows the, the end from the beginning, the Lord said to her, 
two nations are in your womb, and two peoples shall will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Who's he talking about? Who are the two children struggling in her womb? Jacob, Jacob, and Esau. Jacob and Esau. And indeed, Esau, the older, that was born first, did become the servant of the younger, Jacob. And that struggle, as we mentioned last week, that struggle is still going on today. In the Middle East today, between the Arabs and, and the Jews. It all goes back to, to Jacob and Esau. But God... Uh, even with regard to them, God knew uh, and his planning did not stop what was taking place in Rebecca's womb and what took place when those two boys were born. It didn't end with Jeremiah. It didn't end with Paul. Paul is later told, uh, writes and says he was told by God that I have called you, Galatians chapter uh, to be my ambassador, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Did Paul have a choice? Sure he did. But he was convinced that what he had been doing in persecuting the church was wrong, that what he needed to be doing is promoting the church and promoting Jesus and teaching about Christ. And so he went about doing what God wanted and what God had, had planned for him. So, God says to Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. I have plans for you. What was Jeremiah's response in verse 6? I can't speak. I'm young. Sounds like Moses. Yeah. But, the, you know, one thing that one commentator pointed out that I was reading, and he says, Jeremiah did not say, no, I'm not going to do it. He just said, I I don't know how to speak. He didn't say, I will not speak. Maybe there's a point there. He said it demonstrates that weakness may not equal unwillingness. So he's suggesting that Jeremiah was willing, he just didn't feel capable. So how does God respond then to Jeremiah? Don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. I'll put my word. I'll put the words in your mouth. I'll show you or tell you how to speak. I'll be with you all along. So, in order to uh, encourage Jeremiah with regard to this, let's look at verses 10 to 16 and see uh, Jeremiah's mission. mission. God's going to give him a couple of visions here. And uh, he's going to introduce Jeremiah to his work with these visions and in them give a abbreviated explanation and application uh, of how uh, and what God's going to do with, with and through Jeremiah. Let's read first of all uh, verses 11 and 12. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The rod of an almond tree. I'm assuming he means a branch. But, okay, I thought that's in Hebrew it's something. Some translations say that. The almond tree, according to what I read, was one of the first trees in that part of the world to bloom every spring. As winter goes away, uh, it is the first one of the first to, to come, for, come out. And God says that Jeremiah, this 
bloom of the almond tree is to, supposed to signify to you my watchfulness, my watching over my people, my care for my people. You know, in the days of Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh, it had not seen, or it had seemed like God wasn't doing anything. In fact, that charge Zephaniah, but he was on watch, and he was about to execute his word that he had spoken through the prophets. He was about to do something like he promised he would do. <coughs> the time was right, and the time was ready. So that's the first vision. Vision number two starts in verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north, the evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord. And they will come, and they will set each one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls round about and, and against all the cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have sacrifi offered sacrifices to other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. Let's stop there at the end of 16. A pot, a boiling pot, facing away from the north. What does that mean? It's talking about the Babylonians. You know, if you look at a map of that area, Mediterranean Sea, be here, the Dead Sea, Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, and over here you'd find the uh, uh, Tigris and Euphrates and Babylon. Now there are other countries around here, but that's the general play of geography. Where is Babylon in relation to Jerusalem. Northeast, yeah. More not so much no you know, north is always is up here this way. Here top of the map. So why does he say they're going to come from the north? Jeremiah sees this boiling pot. And it's uh, boiling and bubbling and just a cauldron full of turmoil, if you will. And it's facing away from the north, which means it's facing toward the south, toward Judah and Jerusalem. Now, the, all the trade routes and all the, this is all desert. So all the trade routes would come around this way, come down around the desert and come down from the north. All the travel that would be done would come from the north. Um, the political conditions of those days, I mean, Josiah is king here in Judah, in Jerusalem, but all the other countries around, the political condition that God describes as a boiling pot it's probably a pretty accurate situation. Things are in turmoil for the other nations politically. And God sees in all of this a situation where his plans, what needs to happen to his, pun his people, the punishment that needs to come upon them, can be carried out. God sent, showed Jeremiah a vision of this boiling pot facing away from the north, the countries north of Judah, and over 
to the east, northeast, we're developing an atmosphere that is going to spill over. It's going to be like this pot is, is facing from the north, but it's going to eventually be like it's just tipped over completely and dumps all of its contents down across Judah, and that's all the turmoil and political unrest and revolution that's going on in the other countries, and they're all going to come against Judah. The Assyrian Empire was about gone, the ones that had carried the northern kingdom off. Uh, Ashurbanipal uh, has died or will die in the year 627 B.C. He was the king of, of Assyria. The Babylonian kingdom is on the rise as the Assyrians are fading away. And very shortly after God speaks to Jeremiah here, all this contents of this political turmoil is going to be unleashed, poured out on the inhabitants of Judah and uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the idea or the word, let's see what word it was. Yeah, in verse 14, he says, out of the north, the evil will break forth. The American standard says it'll be unleashed. It means it's going to be open. Things are, it's going to open up and things are going to take place. And uh, so God says in this vision, there's trouble going to come. He pictures that trouble in, in the boiling cauldron. God's calling for action. And he is going to later clearly, later in Jeremiah, he's going to clearly and specifically say it's the Babylonians because he's going to speak about King Nebuchadnezzar, who is king of the Babylonians. And so this will be uh, fulfilled there. Turn back, if you want, if you would, to 2 Kings again, this time chapter 24. Second Kings chapter 24, I want to read the first four verses. This is, this is a little later in uh, uh, history than what we read in chapter 22 last week and earlier this time. But uh, the historian records here in verse 1, In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim is the son of Josiah. Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. So initially, the Babylonians make him a, a vassal kingdom. And they pay tribute and they pay uh, respect and honor to Bab the Babylonians and to Nebuchadnezzar. But then the end of verse 1 says, then, that is after the three years, he him turned and rebelled against him, Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord sent against him. Now this, you don't think the boiling cauldron pouring out its contents. Verse 2, the Lord sent against him, that is Jehoiakim, bands of Chaldeans, bands of uh, Arameans, bands of Moabites, and bands of Ammonites. So he sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word. Of the Lord, which he had spoken through his servants, the prophets. Surely at the command of the Lord, it came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood which he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forget. So God predicted with Jeremiah, all these nations are going to come. Here we read that they did. Bands of, of Chaldeans and Arameans and Moabites and 
Ammonites. Just wave after wave, almost as it is, of conquering peoples coming across the land of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. And that God had promised was going to come. God is calling Jeremiah here in chapter 1 to speak to his people and to uh, yeah it's kings that are going to cut yeah yeah ultimately Babylon is going to be the chief of it and they're the ones that's going to carry off into captivity three or four different deportations into captivity uh, including it, one of the earlier ones, Daniel and his three friends, are going to be taken off to, uh, to Babylon. All right, anything uh, else right quick? The rest of the chapter, uh, God calls upon Jeremiah to fulfill his task as a prophet. Every word and phrase has significant implication there for Jeremiah's future. When the various peoples come and attack Jerusalem, uh, and when the people of Judah attack Jeremiah, God's going to shelter him like a fortified city. God's going to uh, be with him and stand with him when the mobs come against him. No, uh, had over here a while ago, Jeremiah preached for over 40 years. Zero positive response. Nothing. Anti what he said. Protest of what he said. Disagreement with what he said. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But as far as a positive result of what he said, Get back over there and read it. Verse 16. Does it help us to understand? Yeah, I think so. I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. Right. Right. Yeah, God did not change. He had told them from the get-go how they should live and they should be obedient to him and worship him. I mean, you shall have no other gods before me. And they did. And and of their own, of their own making. Oh, several hundred. Fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that first century group is well different from the ones that came back out of captivity. Yeah, they did. Right. They were supposed to completely get wipe out all the nations they found in Canaan when they entered into Canaan. They didn't do it. Yeah, and they're about to pay the consequence. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 
That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, history is there. I mean, that's part of why we're looking at this. Part of why God recorded it for us is that we might look at it. I mean, he, he, God, the Spirit inspired Paul to write that the things that were written beforehand were written for our learning that we might see how God deals with us. James pointed out that God's no different. God didn't change. Israel changed. All right, we'll pick up. I want to look a little more at chapter 2 in Jeremiah next week. uh, We'll keep looking at some of these things through through the summer. Thank you.